Good morning, church family. Good morning. Welcome to the service this morning. It's so good to see you all here. I, um, I just wanted to start off by sharing a little thing that happened this week that I found to be quite awesome, worth sharing. Um, so I work, I, I manage a coffee shop during so the week. So usually our Fridays are like extremely busy, one of our busiest days of the week. And we usually get by with just four staff. Um, but we had a particularly bad start when we found out we only had two people, including me. And I was very concerned and I tried to sink out all of this, any solutions and I couldn't find anything. So I was in a very impossible situation. How, well, it felt impossible. And then I thought, hang on, I've got to pause, look to God, ask him for help. And I just said, Lord, please make a way where there seems to be no way. And I just kept saying that. And I just kept saying that. And not even minutes after I said that, um, a young boy had walked up to the counter with the resume uh, looking to hand it in. <laughs> and my boss, the owner, who had just walked in to help us, he quickly talked to him and said, all right, Tiana, this boy is going to drop everything and come and help us. And didn't wow. even know his first name. <laughs> wow. And I was like, yep, you come in here, I'll give you an apron, let's go. I showed him what to do and it just went really smooth. Um, and he didn't even just stay for a little bit. He stayed for the entire day. And just, just, just uh, good for him, he got the job, so. <laughs> um, and, yeah, I, just, I was just amazed by how um, just the fact that he works in such mysterious ways. And it's not always the way that you expect as well. Yeah, you know? beautiful. Mm. Good story. And the next day I had a verse pop into my head and I was like, oh, I better look that up. And he gave me Isaiah 41 verse 10. And it says, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. To fear not means to trust God instead of believing that your situation is, is bigger than God is. He wants us, he wants us to trust that he will be enough no matter what. And so no matter how big your situation is, God is always bigger. And just remember that. He's always bigger. There is nothing that he can't fix. Nothing. So let's pray. Father, we humbly come before you to thank you for all that you've done for us. You are the God that lifts those that are weighed down. You are the God that provides for your children. Our desire is to praise you for all of our lives. Inhabit our praises as we stand today. In your name, amen. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. I will follow you, my 
church as well. Lots of them. Birthdays this week are today. It is Jack Pantland's birthday. He is 92. Happy birthday, Mr. Pantland. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jack. Happy birthday to you. And it's Rita Wingrove's birthday on Saturday, the 6th of February. And happy wedding anniversary to Phil and Sharon for today. <laughs> Just remember that we must follow the COVID rules with our distancing and including when we have morning tea. But thank you for your support in this matter. This coming week, um, today there's a um, pastoral care team meeting from 2.30 to 4 in the Oasis room. On Monday, we have the Seniors Social at 9.30. Tuesday, we have the Connect Group at 9.30. And then there's an Elders meeting that night at 5.30. On Wednesday, the Ladies KYB have a, is having their group at 9.30. And Shannon has one spare KYB book. So if anybody's interested, please see Shannon after church. On Thursday, we have the ASD support group at 7.30 p.m. On Friday, we have the connect group again at 9.30. On Sunday, we have our morning worship. And then um, next Sunday, we have a special members meeting after morning tea. Um, we're having the um, special members morning Special members um, meeting is to, to discuss our upcoming and budget for the year. Paper copies are available for collection. Please read and reflect on this matter. Um, upcoming events, World Day of Prayer. Our church is the host church this year for this service, which has been written by the people of Vanuatu. All are welcome and we will begin at 9.30 on Friday the March the 5th. Religious instruction training, Harvey Bay Christian religious instruction training session on Wednesday the 10th of February from 9am to 12.30pm at Church of Christ, 27 Neal Street, Pialba. In order to comply with current statewide procedures for RI involvement, all interested attendees must pre-register by 3rd of February. Please read the bulletin um, for details. 
And that's all from me. So have a good week, everybody. Well, welcome this morning. I had my welcome to Judy's and um, for, for our, well, we actually don't have visitors. We just have guests because everyone's welcome. And, and uh, but for, for our guests, we just want to let you know that the way we're kind of managing our, our offering in worship uh, through this COVID season is very, very awkward and very, very different. Um, so there, there is an opportunity through the online facility and the details are in the, in the newsletter that you received on the way in. But um, there's also a, a, um, a, a bowl at the, at the front of the church and there's a bowl in the, in the rear hall where we're having morning tea. So we'd really welcome you to stick around for morning tea. Don't expect you to pay for it. But, you know, worshipping God with the whole of our lives are a part of, you know, that whole thing where we're saying, God, you, you are more than enough. You are more than enough. It's not kind of like you get your money and you throw it in the air and whatever lands on the floor is yours and everything else is God's. It kind of doesn't work like that. It, it's actually, in, in terms of our, our offering, it, it's not about our money. It's actually about our hearts. <laughs> and, and, and so it's an expression and the New Testament, you know, some churches bang on about money a lot and they talk about, you know, a tithe and a tenth. And like to, the way I see it, you know, the, the tenth is kind of like a benchmark. But I think the New Testament, what it teaches is generosity. And you can't measure generosity with money. You know, generosity is, is, is with time. Gen- generosity is about sharing talent. Generosity, yeah, finances are a part of that. And the Bible does speak a lot about those sorts of things. But yeah, just, just so that you know how that works. And um, it's great to have you with us this morning. Tony's not real well today. He had a, had a cook night and he's feeling sort of a bit green. So he figured he might stay at home. So you're putting up with me just for a minute for, for a bit of pastoral prayer. It's been a pretty tough week. Um, you know, the, our, our news has been filled with the horror that, that happened in Brisbane this week. And, and, and it's not just about what happened in Brisbane, it's actually something that's had statewide repercussions and, and difficulties and challenges. And it triggers so many things for so many people. And I, I'd really like us to pray. But before we do, I wanna invite Marty to come and introduce us a little mate that he's got and tell us just a little bit of the story of Barney. And, and we'll pray for Marty and Barney as well. Come on down, brother. Bring this little guy, he's an absolute cracker. Cute as, but he's just a little bit more than a pet. And I'm going to ask Marty to, to explain to us a little bit about Barney and what's happened. Come on up, mate. Uh, here, I'll wipe this off so that you can. Hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Barney. Um, I picked Barney up last Saturday and. Um, He's actually going to become a assistance dog or service dog for myself. Um, I'm in the process of training him. Um, I'm using an organisation called Whiskey's Wish and they train me how to train Barney. Um, so with, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, service dogs and assistance dogs and and the etiquette that's involved in 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 approaching in approaching somebody with an assistance dog um barney's in his early training stages obviously um but as he progresses um he he'll go through different stages and i just ask people to uh ask permission before they come up and pat, and pat him um, because it's really important that Barney learns how to interact with people so that um, he doesn't become a problem in the community because eventually he's going to be trained to a point where he'll have uh, what they call public access and that requires him to have the same standards as what a guide dog does and he'll have the same um, he'll have the same access to access to um, the wider community um, and he'll be required to behave as such and, and in, in saying that he'll have to um, 
I've got to train him so that, so that he behaves himself in all circumstances. So I, I just respectfully ask that um, I, don't mind, I don't mind that people interact with him. That's an important part of his training, but it's important that, that he's behaving himself before everybody comes up and wants to have a pat of him. So thank you very much. We're going to pray, and we're going to pray for you and Barney. Yeah. Lord, I, I know for my brother it's been a, a real journey to bring this wonderful little character into his life and uh, that in the fullness of time you brought forth this little guy and I know that, uh, that Marty's going to well and truly take care of this little guy. And I know this little guy's going to well and truly take care of Marty. Help us as a community in our mindfulness and awareness. Help us to delight in Marty and Barney. Help us to, to embrace this wonderful little character and, and to take our part in his training as we want to welcome you, Barney, and Marty to say to you, it's just wonderful. It's really wonderful. I know how much this means. And it's marvellous. And Father, as we stand before you, just really mindful that so many people this week have the, the shock and the horror of the events of Alexandra Hills and, and, and Lord, to, to be aware that, that it, it, it hits each one of us in a very different way. And, and, and Lord, um, we just pray for, for the family that has endured so much pain and loss and grief and, and for other families for whom this moment triggers so many painful memories and grief, that intensifying that sense of grief and loss. And, and Lord, to know that by your Spirit, Holy Spirit, you are our comforter. And I pray for a full measure of your comfort and peace for all who grieve and grieve loss that there would be just that sense of knowing that the presence of God, the peace of God that surpasses understanding, it doesn't make the loss right. But, Lord, you do make loss bearable. And I pray for the grace for, for those who have endured great loss and grief and pain for the courage to, to not so much leave things behind, but to journey forward towards that which you call us heavenward to, that people can find, though the future might be different, that's all it is. And Father, for your grace and your mercy and your love to prevail in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. As we come into a time of worship, uh, I just want to encourage you to um, put all your fears and your worries, all your situations at the feet of God. Um, yeah, so let's, let's proclaim how great our God is. <laughs>
your word may you open up our hearts to your wisdom lord bring us back into alignment with you in jesus name amen um this morning we're following up our you can't ask that series um through through january we we actually did um three messages around you can't ask that which is how can we how can we say that God is in control was the first message. The second was, how do we follow Jesus in the 21st century? I understand Shannon preached a blinder. I might, I might have to move aside. Hey, she did a great job last Sunday talking about how do we love, hard to love people. And, but now we're kind of coming through and into our year and, and launching into a new year as a congregation Majority of our ministries, if they haven't started, they've already started. Uh, school's gone back and things are, are con- continuing on. And, um, and so this Sunday, the focus is around commissioning, the commissioning of us as God's people to our various different roles, whether it's, whether it's you know, within the home and being a homemaker and taking care of children and cooking meals and providing hospitality around that, whether it's a, a high-powered job within government or any, any kind of place in between. And a very special welcome to Gwen Elizabeth this morning. I see that little tyke there. Yeah, thanks for bringing it, Tim. Brittany, appreciate that. I look forward to meeting her in a moment. Wow. 20 or so. <laughs> but um, so we're going to be looking at and considering one of the last things that Jesus said. I don't know, you know, with, with messages and, and people who sort of deliver presentations and stuff, usually the thing we, that we remember the most, the first things they say and the last things they say. Well, the first thing that Jesus said really was that the come follow me, but then followed up by the Beatitudes, that this is where the poor are already blessed, the, the meek are already blessed. These, this is already. So this was the first thing Jesus said, but then the last thing he said is, is around this whole idea of commissioning where, where he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you. From John 20, 21 and 23. So let's read this together. Again, Jesus said, so he's in the upper room. Peace be with you, he says. The Father has sent me, I am sending you with that. He breathed on them, that's the disciples, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So this whole idea of commissioning, and at the end of this message around the communion table, Gwen and Tim, as our elders, will, will commission us as a community this morning. So John includes some elements that happened in the upper room that the other gospel authors don't mention. And this is the first um, of, of one of these is this commissioning of the disciples. So it was the Sunday evening after Jesus had been risen and here he is um, with the disciples. They're meeting, cowering behind closed doors, wondering if they were going to be next. They were afraid of the Jewish leadership. They figured, well, if they did this to Jesus, what hope have we got? And, and then suddenly in the midst of them, Jesus, whew, here he is. He's among them and he says to them, peace be with you. I don't know if you've ever had anybody kind of, not so much ghost you, but, but they kind of, you just have an awareness that someone's standing on your shoulder. You, ah! you, you know, you kind of have that, ah! that, that heart and mouth moment. I reckon it must have been like that. I, I kind of think that it was kind of like this. 
and that Jesus was standing among them, and he says, peace, peace be with you. And as he spoke, he showed them his wounds and his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy. They were filled with unmentionable joy because they saw the Lord. And again he said, peace, peace with you. Sorry, we'll go back to this. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. If not, they're not forgiven. So John records Jesus placing considerable emphasis on the fact that he's been sent by the Father. Over and against the other gospel authors, John, that, that's a, a repeated thing. As the Father, I come to do the will of him who sent me. And he, he, 38 times John records Jesus speaking of him who sent me. So he didn't come on his own business. It's a constant theme in John. And the implications for Jesus are clear. He doesn't come as an independent agent. It's a little bit like, you know, Siddhartha Gautama, 600 years before Christ, the guy they called Buddha. He went and sat under a boa tree looking for enlightenment. Jesus didn't go looking for enlightenment. He was the enlightened one. And, and so the, this whole idea that, that he didn't come on his own agenda. He came. He came not with his own message. He doesn't ad lib. He didn't make things up on the fly. But rather, he only says and he only does what he sees and hears the Father saying and doing. In John 5 and 19 and 30, for those taking notes, he only says and does what he sees and hears the Father saying and doing. And Jesus, through the whole of his message, through the whole of his ministry, stayed on message. John 17, 16 and 18, Jesus told them, My message is not my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants the will, to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. But a person who seeks to honour the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. And Jesus speaking of himself. You see, Jesus' mission of redemption, the work that he accomplished on the cross by removing sin and leaving it buried in a hole in the ground, it's not something that we are to duplicate or replicate. We don't need to do that. It's, that was a once and for all time thing. Nevertheless, we share in his mission as witnesses of what he has done, as witnesses to his resurrection, as witnesses to the transformation that we have experienced, and as witnesses to the redemption that he's brought into the world. Wherever we find ourselves, wherever, as followers of Jesus, it's fundamental for us to understand that as Jesus said, I am sent to do the will of him who sent me, that we similarly are sent by the Father in the same way Jesus was sent. We are no longer our own. We are bought with a heavenly price. We are no longer our own. We are under the commission of Jesus. We bring his message and we're sent to bring it accurately, intentionally, and clearly to not bring attention to ourselves, but to bring attention to him who sends us. And a little later, the elders will lead us in uh, an act of commissioning. Gwen will bring some words around the communion table. Tim will pray and commission us as a people this morning. And we'll be commissioned to all sorts of situations and circumstances and ministries and activities but in it all, there's only one purpose, and that is to bring the message of Jesus to a lost and broken world. As the Father sent Jesus, so now Jesus sends us in this holy relay 
And we're to pass this baton of responsibility onto those who will follow us. Now, Paul reinforces this message. 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, Paul says, We speak as messengers approved by God to be entrusted with the good news, the gospel. Euangelion, the gospel, the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. And then he goes on to say in 2 Timothy 2, you've heard me teach many things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. So Paul hears and sees and reinforces this message that he put into practice. But then there's the Great Commission and, and, um, and John spoke specifically about the commissioning and sending. But each of the Gospels details this idea of commissioning. Mark 16 and 15, he told them, Go into all the way, preach the good news to everyone. And then, of course, the one that that we know so well, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, therefore go, go and keep on going and make and keep on making disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. By the way, how many is all? What I really like about this commissioning, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given and be sure of this. This is a bit that I really like. (laughs) I am with you always. I am with you always. Even to the end of the age. So... There is power in the Holy Spirit. Um, John said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. He breathed, Jesus breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And, and Luke's got, Luke um, says similarly that um, the, the linking of the Holy Spirit with the disciples' commission to declare the truth of sin, that the truth of God, of forgiveness of sin through Jesus' name. It was also written This message would be proclaimed in the authority of his name to all the people, all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There's forgiveness for sins for all who repent. You are witnesses of all these things and now I will send the Holy Spirit just as my father proclaimed. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power from heaven. So that's Luke's record of it. But then we've got his record in Acts where where Jesus says to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And this whole idea of the Holy Spirit um, and this this power that – if you want to know what that's going to look like, you've got to look at Jesus because, you see, he puts a face on the Holy Spirit for us. He's the clearest picture that we have of the active activity of the Holy Spirit in the world. And so if we, we, we want to know what to expect from the Holy Spirit. All we've got to do, Jesus said, I will send another who is exactly like I am. And so we look at Jesus. Jesus puts a face on the Holy Spirit for us. So... This idea of you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be witnesses, telling people everywhere, Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And and immediately the commissioning, if you forgive anyone their sin, they'll be forgiven. And if you don't, they won't. But I I must confess that this is uh, a problematic kind of image Uh, what's the significance of Jesus breathing on them you know was was it a prophetic act of this this wind that you are feeling is something you will experience later or was it symbolic of 
the Spirit who would be sent and manifest? Or did they receive the Holy Spirit there and then? Or when? And I think the, the clearest answer I have for you is I don't know. There you go. I don't know. Isn't that great? Isn't that, isn't that so liberating? We don't have to know everything. The three most liberating words I find is I don't know. But this will be I do know. What I do know is that every follower of Jesus is empowered to his divine purposes by his divine spirit. Now, certainly the first disciples, they received the Holy Spirit when he manifested on the day of Pentecost. This is the divine enabling that you don't see them cowering behind closed doors on that day. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, goes out and starts telling people of the glory of God and the risen Christ. Just an amazing story. So if verse 22 is a mandate, so is verse 23. If the sending, the sending is linked to the forgiving. It's the reception of the Holy Spirit in 22 is linked to the forgiveness of sins in verse 23. The disciples forgive sins because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So in what way do followers of Jesus forgive sins? All sins or just some sins? Well, I, I think um, Matthew 16 has a, an amazing picture to help us understand that. And Jesus says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So, so this forgiving and not forgiving, the, the extending of forgiveness and the withholding is about that which you permit and that which you withhold. And then going on into Matthew 18, 18 and 20, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Seeking God's heart, his will, where we're two together, you know, we, we, we sit, we discern and say, the, the Father, this is the Father's heart, let's seek him on this. If two or three agree, my Father in heaven will do it for you. Where two or three gather in my followers, I'm there among them. So, but in these passages, the metaphor of keys applies to the dispensing of provisions, of inclusion or exclusion to the kingdom. The idea of binding and loosing was used by rabbis for declaring something is forbidden or permitted, referring to behaviours acceptable or that which is unacceptable. It relates to whether a person belongs or not. So when we speak of forgiveness of sin in Jesus' name and extend forgiveness to another, we're saying to them, you belong, you're included. When we witness to to Jesus, to others, we're saying forgiveness is available for you. You belong. This is the kind of picture. And the, the way we extend forgiveness to another, we actually say you belong. And on the occasion that we remain silent, we withhold that forgiveness and we say you don't belong. That's what this is saying. We're saying the opposite thing. Yet now because of Jesus, our belonging to God, it's actually not dependent upon behaviour, lifestyle or choices, but faith. A faith that reveals itself by what we do. It's not about who we are, it's about who we know. It's not about what we are, it's about whose we are. And James kind of wraps up this idea of faith revealing itself by what we do. He wraps it up like this. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that find a kind of faith 
save anyone. Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye or have a good day, stay warm and eat well, then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? You see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It's dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith and others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. And so we reveal our faith by sharing forgiveness of sin through the wonderful story of the gospel that sin is buried in a hole in the ground. Jesus removed what was wrong so that what was right could be restored. And that's what we're inviting people to. You know, in a, in a moment, Gwen will come with Tim facilitate the Lord's Supper as a commissioning of us. And you've heard me speak of the table as the central metaphor of the Christian faith. And we come to the table because of the tree. We cannot break the link between these two things. The table is where we, we remember the message of the forgiveness of sin that's been proclaimed to us but it also been explained to us. The elements, the bread and the wine, they remind us of the cost of the redemption we enter to find forgiveness of sin. That means we now are a covenant people with God. God makes covenants with people. And these are the terms of the covenant that we are reminded to reminding us that we belong to him, we belong to each other, and we are his gift to our world. The table reminds us of the message that we carry and gives us tools to explain that message to people in the world that they might also find the forgiveness that we have found. The table reminds us and others. It's not our message. Just one second. Anne, how, how are they going? So, great, thank you. Thanks, Anne. Appreciate that. So, the, the table re tells us of this covenant. And scripture reminds us time and again, time and again, that God is a God who makes covenants with people. And then he is a God who... who commissions and he is a God who sends and it's most appropriate that around the table today that we're commissioned into this year God is reminding us of this new covenant in Jesus that we belong to him each other and his gift to the world provisions made for forgiveness and life in Jesus. You know, I don't want to steal Gwen's thunder, but the, the, the table is God's provision for all of us. And you might be a guest with us this morning and not really sure on how these strange Baptists do this communion thing. And the way we celebrate it here at Maryborough is this table is for everyone. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you are welcome to participate in the elements as they are passed around. If you are still sorting out the God question and the Jesus thing, the table is for you too, <laughs> to find the hope that your heart is searching for. So please, there are no barriers to the table here in the Baptist Church. You are welcome to participate with us as a community. So... Gwen and Tim, can I invite you to, to come, please? And I just pr pray a very brief commissioning prayer and then I will hand things over to you. And of course, we, we're a man down. Tony's not with us this morning. But...
See, this is family business. This is family business. The family table, this is family business. And Gwen and Tim, on behalf of the Lord Jesus, as pastor of the church here, Maryborough Baptist Church, I now commission you both into and reaffirm your calling as elders among us and release you to minister this commissioning to speak God's heart to us, to our community, and commission us as his people for the year in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks so much, Reese. What a wonderful service it's been. Didn't you enjoy that worship this morning? Thanks, Deanna. That was beautiful, bringing us to the heart of God. And that's where we need to be when we come to a communion service, to the heart of God. Ah, you know, th this is just not bread and wine. You know, let, let, I'll let you into a secret. In my church, which was pretty old-fashioned, you weren't allowed to have communion until you were a baptised by a Mersian believer. I wasn't even allowed to attend a, a service. It was at the end of church and the children all had to go out. That's terrible, isn't it? Reese said it's inclusive. God wants to speak to you through this. And so after I was baptised as a, as a girl of 14, I first attended my first communion service. And of course, all I understood then was that it represented a cost. Jesus died for me. His body was broken. His blood was shed. So that I might have life. But I want to tell you, since then, as I've journeyed with Jesus, I have come to know that it means much, 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 much more than just a cost. Much more. It also means communion. Of course, we call it the communion service. Have you ever wondered why we call it a communion service? That's not a really normal word in English, is it? Communion service? <sighs> Paul's explained to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a communion of the blood of Christ? Is not the bread that we break a communion of the body of Christ? That's the N uh, King James Version. The NIV uses the word participation, which is probably what we understand far better. A participation. A participation. The Greek word is kanoinia, which means communion, participation, partnership, fellowship and sharing. And so this communion service as I grew in Christ came to mean that this was for me an extremely special time with God. When I talked to him personally about my sin, about that bitterness that I have against someone or about that envy I have of someone or that jealousy I have of someone, it's a very individual thing so that I know that my heart is right with God as I thank him for the cost. Then I can bow in awe and thank him for this wonderful gift of his son for my salvation. But we not only meet individually. I mean, there's more than me here today. There's all of us. So we meet collectively. 
join together in the body and blood of Christ as the people of God to worship, serve him in love, in unity, through the benefits and power of the cross. And Reese has talked so much about the power, what God gives us through Jesus' death to be able to serve him. You see, then we hear collectively thinking about this, thinking about the cost. Then we can go and tell someone else what we found and we can tell them that they can be forgiven too. And when they accept that forgiveness, we are part of their journey of forgiveness. Just what Reese was saying. So we come to the fact that the table is not only representation of cost, a representation of communion, it's also a representation of commission. Now, this is becoming a new thought to me. I'm so excited about this because I saw a verse in Philippians, Philippians 1, 4 and 5. Paul says, in my prayers for all of you, you know, all, everybody, I always pray with joy because of your fellowship or partnership in the gospel. Now, that is so profound. Paul started the church at Philippi, but he moved on to tell other people about Jesus. What was going to happen to these people over here? When someone got sick, when someone need prayer, when someone would need help, when someone need teaching, Paul didn't rush back to the Philippians every time that needed. What did he rely on? The body of Christ, their partnership in the gospel. So exciting. Why partnership? Because... One person can't do it all. I've discovered that. I try sometimes, but no, I can't do it all. Pastor Reese can't do it all. The elders can't do it all. The ministry leaders can't do it all. We need your help. And today we want to commission you to help us in the partnership of the gospel. Ephesians 4, 16, and we know this well because uh, Reese did a series on Ephesians 4 last year. Ephesians 4, 16 says, From Christ, the whole body, the church, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Have you got it? Whether you're the cleaner or working in the kitchen or the pastor preaching the sermon, each person does their work. And we've discovered that in COVID, we cannot do without the cleaners. You know, each person is so important. So we're in partnership in the gospel together. As you do your part, everyone else can do their part well. Partnership in the gospel. Each one commissioned and doing their part. And that's what this morning's service is about. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so have I sent you. To whom did he say that? He said it to 11 disciples, not an individual. Did you realize that? To 11 disciples. It's all of you. As the Father has sent me, so I send all of you to work in partnership in the gospel. In a moment, I'm going to ask Tim to pray and thank God for the his, uh, gift of his son, the broken body, the poured out blood. And then I am going to ask um, 
Tim and Sh Sharon, would you help give out the elements, please? And um, we will give out the, the bread and the wine together. The bread, you take a cup with the bread and a cup with the wine. And as you are praying and praying over what I've said this morning about you being commissioned in partnership with the gospel, that you give yourself afresh to the Lord this morning and eat the bread. And then we will wait and take the, the wine together, the grape juice together, which indicates we're all in this together because we can't do it alone. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Gwen. Thanks, Rhys. At the risk of um, having three sermons in one service, I just want to briefly point you to, if you've got an old Bible like me that's on paper, you'll see that immediately after the passage that Reese spoke from this morning is a passage about Thomas who doubted Jesus, who failed him. And Jesus brings forgiveness and says, it's all right, and works Thomas through it to a point of faith. But Jesus accepted Thomas and brought him back. I don't know where you're at this morning. We all come from different places, and we all face a year ahead that will be very different. But Jesus reminds us in this table that he forgives, he works us through our issue and releases us, as Reese has said, removes that sin to help us to be what he wants us to be. The communion table is also, when, when Jesus, if you like, initiated the communion that we participate in, it was based on the Passover. The Passover was a remembrance of liberty, a remembrance that the people of Israel were freed. We have a sense as we face the year ahead, as we join together, that we are freed to serve God. He has dealt with our sin. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for all that you have done for us. Father, as we gather around this table, as we share together as a church family, we want to remember the huge cost. We want to appreciate afresh just what our Lord Jesus Christ did for us, offering himself, shedding his blood, allowing his body to be broken so that our sin could be dealt with. Father, we give you thanks that you raised him to life. We know that his sacrifice was accepted, acceptable to you, and that as we are in him, we are also free. We are also risen to new life. Father, as we face a year ahead in whatever place you have put us, we pray together that you would release us, release us from any sin that we might have. We ask your forgiveness for anything that we might be carrying and we just pray that you would help us to be your presence in whatever part of the community we happen to be. And Father, as we continue together as a church family, as we continue to meet as different groups in this church, meet to serve you, again we pray that you would equip, you would empower as we walk in the freedom that you have given us through the cross. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
church, we are in partnership. We are in partnership in the gospel. Let's drink together and say, Jesus, here we are. Send us. Father, we just thank you so much for opening up ways for us to minister to each other and then to minister to those outside who do not know you. Father, as we're a commissioned church now to go, Lord, bless the ministry that we do this year. Lord, open up hearts, open up minds, open up people to the gospel of Jesus Christ that we might proclaim this wonderful gospel that we know to set people free. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our commissioning to a close um, today. Um, I said to Tiana, I, I, I have a song to finish with and um, it's a song that was deeply meaningful to me in my own commissioning and, and calling as a pastor. And, and so as we stand together to sing the Take My Life song, that this is our commissioning, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Let's stand together.
Father, thank you for your grace to us today and the privilege to be involved with you in partnership in bringing your message of life and hope into our world. Here we are, all of us, take our lives. They're all for you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, please stick around for a cuppa in the rear hall afterwards. We'd love to catch up and have a yarn. If anyone would like to have a chat about anything, I'd be very happy to have a conversation and a prayer. But God bless you and to our online family. Thanks for tuning in today. And we trust today has been a blessing to you as well. And that you may find yourself sent in to your world. God bless you all. Amen. Hey, Nadine.